in order to keep ready to go. My name is Lisa, and I'm leaving. So have a great <laughs> Okay. It's all up to me now, huh? It's all up to you later. All right, I gotta share the screen. I know, right? Have fun, guys. Right? I am like, it's more you. I can't believe it. <laughs> He's not a very good presenter. Oh, yes, he is. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, yeah, everyone. I don't know if I would frame. I guess I should frame. Um, as well You're as looking fantastic. Frame. Yes. All right. Well, welcome to One Nine Cups. And um, if you haven't checked in, you might consider checking in because we give out a free pen at three check ins and a free notebook at six check ins. So I'm going to sit down my coffee for just a second. We're going to trip you. Yep. Come on. Okay. I got my roller through my feet. We got this. All right. So uh, the mission of One Million Cups is to reduce the barriers to access to education, resources, and connection for all new and aspiring uh, entrepreneurs. Oops. There we go. And our local mission, basically, we want to try to make One Million Cups as consistent as possible. And we also, we don't just let anyone come up here and present. We want uh, entrepreneurs who are willing to talk about their journey and their challenges. And, uh, and you as the audience get a chance to ask them questions, maybe make them think about their business in a new way. All right, and there we are, Albuquerque all by ourselves. But it is a national organization. So right now, 9 a.m. across the, uh, uh, across the mountain time, people are presenting at One Million Cups. And it's presentations, not pitches, connections, not networking. Um, and our mission, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but basically, you need to know that you're not doing this alone. We're all here to support you. Um, and if you have a business, <laughs> I feel like Bob. Oh, you got to pull the feet out from the bottom. <laughs> If anyone wants to provide, having issues over there in the corner. Um, but anyway, um, if you want to apply to present, if you have a business and you've sold to more than just your mother, feel free to apply. Uh, we don't generally take nonprofits, or uh, sometimes we don't take people who are just have in an idea stage. <laughs> there is going over there helpful. Um, but you can apply, you can talk to us. Sometimes we break the rules here. And um, this is run by the community. So uh, Paul Sauter, who's over there with the sign. Yeah! <laughs> 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 Not really mechanically, but other than okay. Not an engineer. No, really not. Uh, well, Lisa Atkins, who had to run out real quick. And then Eric Rick Whitmore, Adam Smith Freckle, who's been here this morning, and myself, how are you doing? And as you can see, we all have our own businesses to run. But so we do this out of the goodness of our hearts to help uh, encourage entrepreneurship in Albuquerque. And we're always looking for new talent. Though. That's true. <laughs> There's an open space out here. Yeah, here. Hands on. Put a new name. All right. And uh, these are our awesome sponsors, Fat Pipe ABQ. We've been here eight years. Yes. Right? Yep. Here. Eight is amazing. Um, so eight years here at Fat Pipe. If you ever need a space to rent, Get away from the dishes, the cats, the television. This is the place to do it. Uh, rent a space, get some work done for the day. Jason Collin Photography, our official photographer. Yes. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Taking some awesome pictures. Uh, more than organized, Miriam brings the, the creamer. Uh, GOS Capital, who is our coffee sponsor. And Aventum Custom Software, who brings the donuts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That it? That's the last. That's the last screen. All right. Oh no, there it is. Oh, <laughs> it's just it's just going everywhere. You know, we who knows what else we might have in I know, before. right? <laughs> All right. Well, I am done, but I believe Paul is up next. Yes.
All right. I was just checking in because I want that coveted notebook. Not working for me. So it is a real pleasure to have Webb back here. Uh, Webb and I go a long way back. Uh, when I first entered the private sector, uh, I entered a pitch competition and no one in the room knew me. I won the pitch competition and one of the people coming up to me at the end was Webb. And he said, you have to get an ABQ ID and just audit this. The following year I entered ABQ ID and Webb is the person who reached out his hand to start me on the process of getting my street MBA. Uh, Webb has gone on to do marvelous things and I'm not gonna step on his talk at all. Uh, I think you're gonna be uh, really enlightened by the scale with which he's working. Thank you, come on Webb, lay it on. All right, and I'll mention it says as the tech guy here today that uh, if not, since I'm using a different computer than I've ever used before, uh, this may have a couple of little hiccups here and there. No, no worries. But, uh, but we should be able to get this. Yeah, we should be able to get it. It's, it's the joys of using a single system to do three screens. <laughs> so what I've got to do in just a sec is, I'm just going to narrate through it. Let's see who who's got a song and dance routine. Mary, I love it. Let's see. I could do it. I'm not going to do a dance. This is excellent. We don't have a karaoke. All right. Oh, I feel so much better. Oh, good. You that should be, you should be alone. There we go. Yes. I think there. Uh, I, uh, good morning. Um, good morning. I'm touched by, uh, by Paul's introduction. Yeah, I've been on this peculiar, um, I think it's a three year cycle, right? Uh, that, uh, first presentation of, of, about Pajarito powder was 2016. Uh, and then again, in 2019 and here we are in 2022. Uh, so I, at least consistent, if anything, um, my name is Webb Johnson. I'm on the management team for Pajarito powder. Uh, we are about a 10 year old uh, company. We have debated about whether we can call ourselves a startup anymore. Uh, <clears throat> but we make electric catalysts for the uh, hydrogen fuel cells and electro electrolyzers. Uh, we have a very world class team of uh, scientists and engineers. And, uh, and the news I really want to share today is about some new investors. There was some news last year, um, but that has been augmented by new activity, new activity. <laughs> oh, no. I know what happened, it's right now. There we go. All right, so uh, last summer, uh, Hyundai came aboard as an investor as part of a series B round of financing. Yeah. Hyundai Motor Group represents a wonderful investor for us uh, in terms of uh, strategic investors. Uh, brand new to the family, however, is Beckert uh, that uh, joined our series B2. Um, as of September 1st of this year, and we couldn't be more excited. We've uh, doubled in size since about 14 months ago, I want to say. So we've been a little bit hiring spree. Um, we're all about 20 employees now. The joke is that, uh, you know, right as we get past 20, somebody somebody moves on to other things. So we're, we've been fluctuating right around 20. Uh, but yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, and uh, most exciting for me and my role as director of business development uh, is that our sales continue to, to do very well year over year. So this is becoming very real all of a sudden. Let's see, this one. there we go. Uh, a little bit more about Beckert. Uh, Beckert's about a 120 year old Belgian company. Uh, they, they started their life uh, making uh, barbed wire way back in the day. They've since become very, very good at metal fibers. That is their specialty. There's a 70% chance that the tires you're running on have metal belts made by Beckert inside the tires. I may have been a slide. Oh, let's see. We'll go back. Sorry. Sorry about that. All right, I'll stop touching buttons. Um, and then um, to round out our investor group, obviously Hyundai, uh, Verge, uh, local startup, uh, excuse me, Seed Stage Venture Fund uh, was the originator. Uh, I'll talk a little more about Tom Stevenson, um, who founded the company. And then of course, Old Apollos Group uh, as, as part of our core investor group. 
So let's back up a little step. Um, let's talk about what uh, what are hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, if you think of a battery as electrochemical storage, a hydrogen fuel cell is basically electrochemical conversion. The use of feedstock or fuel to basically create electricity. In this case, and predominantly for this conversation, we're going to talk about hydrogen fuel cells. So what you, I want you to focus on is the fact that this is basically a stack of individual electrodes. Uh, the magic sauce is our material that goes in the center of what's called this uh, membrane electrode assembly. <clears throat> uh, conversely, where you get this delicious green hydrogen from, it comes from a device called an electrolyzer. Uh, for you hairy men out there, this is not that form of electrolysis. <laughs> this is uh, uh, what is called uh, broadly now in the industry, water electrolysis. Uh, there are two principal flavors, two principal chemistries, PEM, proton exchange membrane on the left and alkaline on the right. Um, and, uh, and basically it's the reverse process for a fuel cell. Basically you're taking water, you're zapping water, you're separating it in, into its constituent parts of hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, both can be captured for whatever purpose. If you want to capture the oxygen for other applications, because ox oxygen is valuable, uh, and then the, the hydrogen is compressed for later use, either storage uh, and or use in a, a device like a fuel cell. Uh, we're, I'll try to focus uh, very tightly on uh, what we make because it's a, it can be a little expansive in terms of catalysts, but we basically make catalyst powders. Uh, we started life uh, primarily focused on platinum or PGM free catalysts containing no precious metals. Uh, those are great for certain applications, but for very heavy duty, high energy, energy density applications, you really do need some PGM of some kind. Uh, we make uh, catalyst supports, which are kind of our claim to fame for specific uh, uh, applications, particularly in transportation. And we will, are also capable of making our own reference electrodes, but we don't sell those. Those are basically just evaluating mm -hmm. our materials in systems. All right, so there's a couple of reasons why, why we're doing this, right? The world's in a race to decarbonize a lot of different systems. And it's not purely around energy. It's also involves uh, specific industries. And hydrogen is an ideal vehicle for that. It's an energy carrier. So it means you can decouple from the grid, which is extremely valuable since it can't always be attached to the grid. The grid's not the most efficient way to move energy around. In fact, I have a slide we can talk about later that it's about one seventh or one eighth of the efficiency to push electrons around from, instead of molecules. So if you can push gas as molecules around, you actually, considerably more efficient. Uh, these are some of the near-term opportunities that are like coming at us. This is why we've received some of these investments. Uh, across the top, it's all about energy storage. It's about producing hydrogen as a feedstock. Principally, what we're talking about here is green hydrogen. Uh, and then also uh, decoupling energy from the grid. The uh, current uh, active opportunity for us is right around heavy trucks right now because moving goods is very energy intensive. The transportation sector accounts for somewhere between 20 and 25% of CO2 emissions around the world. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But I wanna focus on these bottom elements down here. Uh, ammonia on there on the left. If you're gonna make fertilizer, you need to make green ammonia. And the only way you make green ammonia is if you derive it from green hydrogen. Uh, most of the ammonia in the world right now is made from hydrocarbons. So if you're gonna decarbonize that industry, you're gonna need green hydrogen. Steel making right now is very, uh, very uh, hydrocarbon intensive. You're gonna need green hydrogen, green concrete. What's the number one, uh, what do you call this? Uh, the number one uh, resource consumed in the world in New Mexico, you're going to know right off the top of your head. Concrete. Water. Yeah. Oh, water. Water is the number one consumed uh, resource of the world. Concrete is the second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if you need to decarbonize your construction, you're going to need green hydrogen to, to decarbonize concrete. And, and then lastly, heating. You know, if you burn hydrogen, 
that's derived from green sources, um, you're basically oxidizing or returning it as water vapor to the atmosphere. So there's a lot of value in producing green hydrogen for a whole host of applications. All right, so uh, part of this is one of the principal reasons why things are accelerating in this space right now. Um, as of February 24th, the date of this year, uh, the European Commission had established as their policy to come out of COVID, a very aggressive uh, timeline for producing 80 gigawatts of electrolyzed hydrogen for European consumption. Uh, six gigawatts of that was going to, and this is, these are enormous numbers, right? Six gigawatts were gonna come from domestic production in Europe of electrolyzed hydrogen. Uh, the goal was by 2030 to have 40 watts produced in Europe and 40 probably imported from North Africa where there's such a great solar exposure. So they're gonna make hydrogen in North Africa and export to Europe. Uh, again, that was gonna be about $42 billion worth of investment. Then this happened, <laughs> this happened and has changed economics around the world, particularly as it applies to hydrocarbons. Uh, right now, it's actually more affordable in some places to actually use green hydrogen today than gray, mm -hmm. gray hydrocarbon sources because of this. So all of those numbers changed very dramatically and goals were revised dramatically up. And so we're talking about a substantial <laughs> increase in the mm -hmm. overall investment that the European oh. Union is talking about around in terms of electrolysis. All right, so back to trucks. Um, how many of you use Amazon? All right, um, that's probably gotten to you by truck, right? So there are these staggering numbers around the world about uh, how goods uh, and resources are moved around. And, you know, it, it probably starts with a boat and then ends up on a train and then a truck. But the, the net result is that transportation has a substantial, is a substantial contributor in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, right? And so we need to decarbonize transportation. Uh, there are about five or six of these major truck manufacturing companies. You're going to note some pretty substantial names up there. Um, one of the, the most of these uh, are uh, actually have uh, some combination of battery truck and hydrogen truck plan uh, being rolled out. Uh, and uh, there's a specific reason why a lot of people are talking about hydrogen, and it's because as uh, weights increase and distance increase, that drive cycle changes. Batteries work well for specific cycle, mm -hmm. but uh, they do not have the energy density required to take really heavy loads long distances. Uh, in terms of drive cycle, um, if you think about somebody running around town doing deliveries, doing stop and go, that can benefit from regenerative braking, batteries are great. But if you get on a highway and you just press go mm -hmm. and you're running hundreds of miles suddenly becomes that regenerative braking doesn't play in as much. Uh, and it makes much more of an interesting and compelling case for hydrogen. Excuse me, are you this, able to uh, speak a little louder? Yeah, sorry, I, uh, I should have grabbed some water and I didn't grab some water, so. Um, he's got me, thanks. Uh, this is a slide from uh, Kenworth. And so they know a little something about trucks. And one of the reasons why they're not as aggressively pursuing batteries is because you'd sacrifice something on the order of about 25% of your load uh, for the, the both the uh, weight and volumetric component of batteries. So this is where hydrogen actually has a slight edge with uh, giving by giving up a much lower amount of your payload. Uh, so, uh, very quickly, I want to touch on the board. We've added some folks. Um, uh, Christian Mordeek from Self Centric. You'll notice on the prior slide about truck companies. Christian ran Daimler's fuel cell program for a number of years. He is uh, tapped uh, to actually be the CEO for Self Centric, which is the uh, joint venture between Volvo and Daimler Trucks. Uh, 
uh, Daimler, uh, Mercedes-Benz feel so strongly about this that they actually separated the company. Uh, the uh, truck company, I don't know if you noticed earlier in the year, uh, Mercedes-Benz actually split apart the, the passenger car group um, is going to focus on batteries and the truck company is going to focus on hydrogen. And they felt so strongly about this that it separated into two separate companies. Uh, Inga uh, Schildermans uh, from Becker just recently joined us. And of course, uh, Sukhwan Yoon uh, from uh, Hyundai Venture Capital joined us last year. I'm trying to stay respectful of the time because I'm, I think I'm running close. Uh, Dr. Olaf Conrad, um, our CTO of production engineering. And then we do have one person uh, remote part-time in Japan, Dr. Saburo Ori, who works for us in Japan. Uh, so with that, I think the best policy here, oh no, I got one more slide. And uh, there we go. I'm, I'm begging for talent. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, using, um, I'm using this bully pulpit to, to, to look and recruit for some folks. Uh, we, we are looking for a director of R&D. If anyone has uh, some folks that they would like to send my direction, I'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, we're expanding. Uh, it, uh, I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit more about what's actually going on specifically, but, uh, but in the in the in the Q and A follow up. But uh, I'd be happy to mm -hmm. to uh, to look at anybody that you might be able to send to me. Um, so with that, I can conclude, and we can go to supplemental slides or whatever. Awesome. All right, folks, and I'm going to remind you that when you come up here, um, let us know who you are and what organization you're with. I need to talk. Well, Rep. Hey, Rep. I'm Dr. Moore. Hi. Yeah, my company is. We're going to scoot over. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Rev, I'm Dr. Norm. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Norm. I'm with uh, drnormsconnections.com, and my specialty is dementia prevention. I have a question for you that I'm an old guy, 75 almost, and uh, back in 1937, there was this wonderful technology called hydrogen blimps and balloons. Mm -hmm. 1937, Hindenburg blew up. And so whenever I see hydrogen, the technology that you're sharing here is just fantastic. I know there's a German company that made hydrogen powered train and they shipped it to the United States train company here. So I can see this is going to be wonderful. But the question I have for you is younger people probably don't give a flying flick about about being really safe. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. Uh, uh, very briefly. Um, all right. So there's a couple of things. Uh, I think Mythbusters did Mythbusters or Secrets of the Dead. Um, yeah, somebody did like a really great summary that was all about the the, the aluminum coat paint that they used in the Hindenburg that was what really caught fire. And you know, if your envelope catches fire, it's really hard to oh, keep the rest of it from burning. Um, but uh, let me see if I can. Um, one thing I, I, I'd like to I mean, you know, these days you could make something get get there. I don't know what's going to be there. <laughs> Um, there, uh, two points. Well, we're looking for the slide that I'm going to show you. There's two points, right? Um, our, our snarky response when people are, and, and you're very kind, so I'm not going to be snarky. <laughs> but our snarky response when people are antagonistic about this is, what do you think you've been driving on all these years, right? It's a, it's, it's a bomb of 15 to 18 uh, you know, gallons of, of high energy. Which way should I be going on this? Um, toward the end. Toward the end, okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, basically, there is no fooling a little bit more, a little bit more. It's going to be where the videos are. A couple more. Um, next video. Next video. Bullet penetration? Uh, not the bullet penetration. We can come back to that one, but the next. And if you want to uh, press play, I can talk over this. But, uh, but basically, uh, there's no fooling physics, right? You know, there's no fooling mother physics. The amount of energy it takes to propel a two-ton vehicle down the road is the amount of energy it takes propel a two-ton vehicle down the road, right? It doesn't matter how you're powering it. That, uh, that energy is still manifest in there regardless. And so what it boils down to is that uh, everything is dangerous. What you do is you engineer the safety in. We've done that with cars, but uh, I think this video... Yeah, we're having some trouble. It, it, it's, well, you have to, when you go to share screen, make sure you turn on the video. 
Yeah, yeah, but okay. I'm not sharing screen right now. I'm okay. just on, yeah. I stopped sharing. Loading. All right, it's okay. It's a <laughs> this, this is literally a 30 year old video that was actually conducted at Sandia with a GM car. Uh, and what it was, was a, it was a uh, leak test, hydrogen leak test. And they showed side by side uh, a gasoline car and, and a hydrogen uh, car. And, and basically what happens, uh, the, the safety feature on a hydrogen vehicle is that it basically just releases the hydrogen into, if an accident occurs, uh, tank is ruptured, uh, the valves are just designed to specifically release the, vent the hydrogen. The tank vents in under about 90 seconds or something like that. And what they show is if there's an ignition, and this is the beautiful thing about hydrogen, it burns, it's not explosive. You literally have to mix oxygen into that tank to get it to explode. And that's a quality control function. You're hoping that you're not pumping any oxygen in there, but those are, again, things that are engineered into systems. Um, and what the, the, the lovely video that I can't show you right now is, uh, is basically uh, reflects that the temperature at the rear window where this flame vents doesn't change by a couple of degrees, whereas the gasoline car, and if you're familiar with gasoline, it pools, right? And it pools and it engulfs the entire car in a big ball of fire. Um, gasoline is very explosive, yada, yada, yada. It's a very dramatic version of things if you have an accident that ruptures the tank and catches fire. Um, it's, uh, it's actually in large measure probably safer. We've also seen the energy density manifest in battery cars, right? Where a testing will burn for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. I mean, it's just a matter of matter of how you release that energy. And so I think the short answer now <laughs> moments later is that it is the safety is engineered into these systems. But thanks for the question. It's a great question. Yeah. I think we need to address it. So, wow. Hi, Paul Sutter, founder and chief scientific officer of Equiseek. We develop and sell genetic tests for horses. And think Pinto, not Hindenburg. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you can use that. Yeah, that's right. So I want to ask about the killer app that we've discussed for hydrogen, which is container ships. And I know you have a backup slide to that. Roll past. You want to put that up and tell us about that? Because I think that is we really will try. promising. All right, let's jump in there. Good luck, Eric. Yeah, we got it. It's going to happen. <laughs> All right. Yes, that's, that's a slide right there. Good. This Good. one? Next one. Next one. This one. Yeah. Oh, I see there container ship, right? All right. So this, this is a big deal, right? Uh, again, uh, how many of you ordered from Amazon? Uh, how many of you ordered something that probably came from another country across the Pacific? Uh, yeah, me too. All right. So we, we have a problem, right? The, it's a little hard to see um, if you can minimize the screen or the... Or, I'm sorry, Eric. We've got I so make, many. Here we I go. Whoa, it, we're going to move the top. Yeah, put it right there. That's yes. On the bottom. Perfect. Um, all right. So, one big container ship pollutes equivalent to about 50 million cars. <laughs> 50 million. Now, I, you know, you got to clarify these, these numbers, right? This is predominantly because what they're burning is asphalt, right? We talked about this earlier. I mean, it's bunker fuel. It's it's pretty heavy, dense stuff. It's got a lot of sulfur in it. So the pollution they're talking about is predominantly like real pollution. You would not want this stuff, you know, around humans, but we do it out in the ocean. And so this is a fundamental piece of why fuel cells represent an opportunity to push heavy, heavy vehicles around the world and do it cleanly. Uh, this can be done. There are a lot of people who are working on this right now. There are several fuel cell ferries in, um, in operation in Europe right now. Um, I know there's one uh, going into operation uh, in the Bay Area. It might be in operation right now, I'm not positive, but uh, they're starting with fairly small boats. Electrification is great, right? A lot of boats are already electrified. We already know the benefits of high torque motors. Um, it, it works really well. You just got to figure out how to do this. It is very, very hard to do with batteries. Again, the energy density, both both specific and volumetric, just isn't there. Sandia did a study where you'd literally have to have uh, two boats the size of the one you're trying to push uh, of batteries to get it across the Pacific. So these are, again, this is not a simple task for hydrogen either, um, but there are a lot of folks working on this. And a couple of cruise lines and shipping lines have already announced their intentions to deploy hydrogen-enabled boats within the decade. Bravo, thank you. Sure. Good morning, I'm Franklin Wilson. Hi, Franklin. I'm a farmer, uh, operated foundation. A uh, couple of questions. What 
percentage of world transportation is hydrogen powered today? Oh, uh, it's uh, minuscule. Um, there's um, there's about 50 of those Hyundai trucks running around Switzerland right now. Um, it's kind of cool. It's a it's a transportation ship. What do you call it? It's a delivery uh, company that's basically leasing these trucks to individual companies. So they're all branded different. But you see about 50 of these running around Switzerland. There's um, uh, I, it's a it's an incredibly small. Okay. It's a very early stages of this. The next two questions I can bundle them together. Uh, I have a hybrid vehicle that runs on battery and on fuel when I need it. So is there a hydrogen, uh, regular fuel, uh, diesel, hybrid? And what is the range on the, when you fill up your hydrogen, what's the range on a, on a truck? So that, that, that's a bunch of great questions. Right. So, so uh, about 20 years ago, uh, BMW actually released a hydrogen burning uh, car that the, the His Serene Royal Highness, the Crown Prince of Monaco, actually bought and uh, and owned. And so, you, they, they've been burning hydrogen in, in internal combustion engine applications for a number of years. There's a really interesting set of companies that are looking. That they do a couple of things, right? They have a, a an under the hood electrolyzer, basically. Uh, uh, making green hydrogen to, squirt, to squirt into the injector path to clean up your emissions on diesel trucks. Um, so there's there's a bunch of folks who do some really neat stuff to clean up emissions. You can you can burn hydrogen again, just basically uh, combine recombines with oxygen, turns into water vapor, gets emitted back into the atmosphere. Uh, but that's not the most efficient way to use it, right? If you're going to go to the trouble of making green hydrogen, you should use it electrochemically and run an electric motor with it. And uh, I'll point out the difference because the Toyota Mirai has a five kilogram tank of hydrogen and that car can go 350 miles on that tank of hydrogen. So if you do the quick math, you know, look, let's round it down for my simple brain, 300 miles. <laughs> so that's like 60 miles per kilogram. Um, there's the same energy. I have a slide, I'm so sorry, Eric. I have a slide. Uh, that shows you that there's the same energy in a, about the same energy in a gallon of gas as there is in a kilogram of hydrogen. But the difference is that gallon of gas only gets you, you know, 25 or 30 miles in a car versus 60 in an electric vehicle using hydrogen. So again, the, it's, it's all these compoundings of efficiencies. It's going to be closer to the, the uh, up to the top or right there where the gap where the uh, barrel is. Yeah, thank you. All right, we're, we're, we're making this work. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 sorry, I had a couple of these that, uh, yeah, um, uh, I, we, we get attacked a lot, right? We get attacked from all sides. I'm not going to talk about politics, but we get attacked about hydrogen's dumb uh, because, you know, we could just be dumping this electricity. It takes energy to make hydrogen, so that's dumb. We could just actually be using it from the grid. Um, and uh, we'll go to those slides. But this is the other side of that equation. We could just be using oil, right? That's really efficient. Well, here's a fundamental uh, issue, right? Um, West Texas Intermediate, right now, if you ask any producer, it costs somewhere about 60 to $75 to, to get there. That's if, if oil prices go below $75, this is on the wholesale market, uh, they they will not turn on you wells because they are literally making no money because it takes them that much to produce WDI, right? So on the this is on the hydrocarbon side of things. You know, part of the reason whenever somebody says, "Why should we be using energy to make energy?" We already do. I mean, this is already done. And and if you start to like break down this math about the the uh, uh, 19 gallons in a 42 gallon barrel. Of gasoline, uh, quite literally, at some of these rates, you can immediately get to about a ten or twenty cent equivalency of per kilowatt hour for hydrocarbons. And the DOE has uh, an estimate that what they want to do uh, uh, for hydrogen is they want to get us to one dollar per kilogram of hydrogen in ten years, and and that will 
blow away uh, lots of other sources of energy. So uh, I'm going to come back to. That's good. I, I think I think I got most of your question. Yeah, the hybrid is existing now. Uh, yeah, so highly efficient. That's the one. Of the the last piece that I wanted to answer is that um, I think this is the real opportunity, right? Which is uh, hybridization, at least in the in the short term, maybe even long term, is the right answer. And by hybridization, I mean that if, if you have uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cell range extenders, um, you basically can make a much smaller battery in a battery electric vehicle. And then you can take advantage of, of all kinds of resources, whether you can plug in your car to your grid when you're at home. Um, Eric, do you mind <laughs> sliding this back to a couple of couple of places? Certainly, and, and we're and getting refuel as you're going down the road uh, uh, with hydrogen uh, to, to make it. Sorry. Uh, I'm making this complicated, but I, but I, I think we got uh, I got, got you there. Answer. All right, good. Uh, I'm not sure which uh, uh, which go, slide we're going to go up. All right, the this one not, uh, right right after the yeah. yeah. You're, you're we're going to continue one. editing. That's fantastic. <laughs> Here, let's let's just really right, mess with your. That's uh, right. You can leave it like uh, in the small format, and I'll try to explain it. Right. All right. So this is the other piece of that um, I didn't dumb because we could just be using this energy off the grid. Um, but this is the problem. Most of the world doesn't have yeah. garages, you know, rooftop solar. It's really hard to like, uh, whenever you have these kinds of, and just for reference, right? Um, suburb of Shanghai. So it's not your typical Shanghai skyline, but that is Shanghai top left. Mm -hmm. This is Paris, cheap, see the Eiffel Tower. Ha. Uh, this is Tokyo. Uh, anyone recognize that one on the lower left? That's future Albuquerque. <laughs> um, whenever we say like, well, you know, we don't have those kind of densities. So what? That's Dallas. Okay. You know, oh, it is Dallas. Right. So uh, this is this is authentically an issue because you know a lot. Like when I go to Germany, uh, and you know, we we'll rent a car. Like, uh, and we'll we'll rent Airbnbs for conferences or something like that. Uh, and it's I'll return home to my Airbnb after the conference, and I park. 800, 400 meters away, you know, I'm down, I'm down the block a ways because I got to find a place to park and there's no garage. I mean, if there's a park plots around, you know, maybe it's in a commercial area, but in a residential, uh, you're parking on the street. And so it is enormously complicated with most of the world's grid is starting to look like this, right? Mm -hmm. Right. We've got some real issues. There's a great book. I think it's called The Grid. Um, where we talk about one of the fundamental challenges that we face right now is energy storage. It's got to be energy storage. We've got to figure out energy storage. Renewables don't work without energy storage. Hydrogen can represent a piece of that. There's a real opportunity there, but energy storage is going to have to be a big piece of this. And it can and and when it comes to like electrification, we just can't rely on the grid to be the sole way we're going to we're just not going to charge all of our vehicles. Uh, at our residence, the world's not gonna not gonna work like that. All right, uh, sorry, you had a well. I, I, so I'm gonna jump oh, in. Yeah, yeah, so I've I've got I've got five questions. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I just want to mention you've got some negative self talk in your slides. It's like the web is dumb. Well, you know why is web such an idiot? What, what what's what's with that man? No, I got you. Uh, <laughs> so I just say you know you seem like a very smart individual. We may have known each other for a while. Um, <laughs> Question that I've got, and I'm wondering how well this might apply to like other entrepreneurs, is when Pajarito started, when you first got involved, you're entering these complex systems, these super complex ecosystems around trucking, around uh, let's see, uh, battery and energy storage, but also grid systems. And so I'm wondering how, as an organization, did Pajarito Powder come to understand like these different ecosystems to see where you could play a role and you know, who are the different players? I'm curious that there was like, you know, Tom like did a ton of research and then got a, you know, a doctorate. What was it that, that kind of led to understanding so you could figure out where you fit and where would be the most uh, commercially viable uh, place to participate? Oh, Eric, Eric this is, I'm a systems guy. Yeah, so. no, no, it's, <laughs> it, it's fabulous, right? And, 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 I, and I'm a startup guy, born and bred, right? Like a, in, in terms of like, I view the world as sort of, uh, you know, lean, lean startup, you mm -hmm. know, you ask a lot of questions, right? And, and, and they did a lot of that. The problem is that, uh, and, and it, it's both humbling,
because I'm a victim of my own teaching. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, secondarily, the, the, the teaching is sound, right? If you build sort of a continuous learning loop, and, and, I, and I love that you asked this question because this is right up your alley, right? So it, as a culture in a company, mm -hmm. if you build this sort of uh, continuous learning loop into the culture of the company mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, do we, do we know, you know, how much of this is supposition? How much of this do we actually know? You know, who actually knows? Who can we go talk to? Right. And we, we, we talk to somebody and they're like, have you thought about blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no, no, we're going to fake them. Like, sure. We thought about that. But we didn't think about that. We need to go talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. So, that, I mean, it, it's not elegant. It's not pretty, but, uh, but it's manageable if you yeah. sort of build in this culture of like, oh, like we could go learn this. And uh, I mean, the whole maritime thing, we got approached by an organization called the, gosh, I'm so super embarrassed, uh, out of Savannah, it was the uh, Ocean, Ocean Exchange. And they're lovely people. They actually had Tom come present. Um, uh, it was an amazing event. Um, but we, we're <laughs> mar maritime, oh, yeah, we, we know catalysts, right? You know, it was like, <laughs> well, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't know anything. And, and so, uh, but it was funded by one of the, the the largest roll on roll off carrier. So we started learning the terms. Yeah. What's a what's a row row carrier, right? I should have thrown out to the audience, right? So uh, somebody is going to know, right? So uh, uh, um, yeah, there's a bunch of shipping lines um, and, um, and and a bunch that specialize in just cars now, and they're mm -hmm. row row carriers. And that and these guys were like actually mm -hmm. really interested in how do we start to electrify our fleet of uh, row row carriers. Mostly because they're, it's a Norwegian shipping firm. They carry the most Teslas in the world on their boats. They're carrying these beautiful uh, uh, decarbonizing cars to Norway on a boat <laughs> that burns, you know, asphalt. <laughs> I, I'm sure it's better than that. I'm sure like yeah. they, they have the investor. But again, these are things that you, that you learn. You have to, you know, jump in and figure out the industry wherever you're at. And, and there are always so many different multitudes of angles to it. I want to mention one thing. So we've got at least one question online. We're going to get to Michael here so I can do whatever movement around screens that I need to do. And I guess that we'll see if we have any other questions. And then uh, like final call for questions in the house. If you've got, all right, come on up, get in line. And then uh, you'll, you'll be, yes, exactly. Yeah, we, we, we won't forget you. <laughs> hey, so um, I just sort of sent you, uh, I now. But my question is this, is that New Mexico is trying to put itself at the center of the hydrogen world. You know, we have that four state agreement. I, I have to assume that you guys are very integrated into that talking because they probably want to promote this industry among others. Um, so my question is, is like, what's your integration? What do you think of that, the hydrogen hub stuff? And do you think that there's other opportunities for um, Right. Well, you can, you can, yeah. you got a big thing. Right. The, 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 in the, so, the, okay, the, in the larger pantheon of this hydrogen hub ambition, it's very new. Uh, we just got invited to submit some of our comments about where we are. We're, we're a custom, we're, we're a component provider in a, in a large supply chain, right? So, so we're pretty far downstream from cars. We're pretty far downstream from, from producing green hydrogen. We, but we make a very crucial piece of the puzzle. And, uh, and the DOE, actually, we have a very good relationship with the uh, uh, fuel cell and hydrogen office. It used to be, the change name, it used to be FCTO um, of the DOE. Um, so uh, we uh, are considered a strategic resource in the sort of panoply of strategic materials um, uh, for the DOE in terms of, uh, as a catalyst company. There, there's only a handful of folks who make uh, these kinds of catalysts around the world. They tend to be very big companies and none of them in the U.S. And so we are a U.S. The joke used to be that we are the largest uh, catalyst manufacturer, uh, green catalyst manufacturer in the U.S., but we're also the smallest. <laughs> so, uh, so we're it's the, like one MC in Albuquerque. Yeah, we're, we're the only, right? So, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice privilege to uh, air. Uh, to, to be the only, um, but it, there's some challenges there, right? And and I, I see some challenges as the hydrogen hub stuff uh, gets further refined. Um, communication's a great idea. I'll uh, 
I'll just leave it at that, that, uh, that uh, there needs to be broader and better communication across <laughs> the entities involved. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're, you know, there's some really smart people working on this. Uh, you know, um, I know that Lanel's got a, a fair bit of leadership involved and, and it goes to a high level. And that's really important, right? And New Mexico needs to assert its place in this world. These are, these are um, once in a generation or once in several generations shifting industries. And that's what's going to happen. And it's going to be really important. I'd love to see, you know, CNM take on some, some technician roles around this. I'd love for them to understand, you know, uh, what are, what are the, folk, the jobs of the future that are going to be around this space? Um, safety is going to be a paramount. If somebody's rolling up to a hydrogen fueling station, you know, it'd be great that uh, people know how, how to keep those things safe. Um, it's no different than what's existed now, but those things have you know, been codified and understood for a hundred years. So, but this is all new. So we've got a lot of work to do, but in that work, there's a lot of opportunity. So I think New Mexico could seize that opportunity and become a real player. I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's a political answer. Very diplomatic. I appreciate <laughs> I guess, that. I guess maybe like in the specifics, it's like so they're talking about doing um, gas conversion, right? To get hydrogen as part of the hydrogen hub. Of course, that has echo, that is not green hydrogen, blue hydrogen. Sure right or green hydrogen and you know and, and so you can kind of present a path forward that's like as you solve this problem right. that that use goes away we, we, we could probably just briefly touch on the, these colors right you, you hear these colors being thrown around blue hydrogen is basically hydrogen derived from hydrocarbons that dinosaurs with a carbon capture component um, and, and and what makes it blue is it, it's basically uh, a lower impact uh, fuel than pure hydrocarbon burning and emitting into. Um, I, I, I am, I'm a, I'm a diplomat by nature, right? I'm like, I, I, I see that these things as a process. You know, how many of you still carry in, um, you know, your, your Verizon Razor or flip phones, right? So these are technology cycles that go in 10, 15, 20 year cycles, right? Uh, I, I'm a big believer that when you're talking about something as massive in scope as energy, you can sink a lot of money into some technologies that won't be relevant in 10 years, and it's still okay. Uh, and the world needs all of this. Uh, the, the thing I dislike the most is when people put their foot down too, uh, and again, I, like, I, I apologize because it's going to sound political, but what it is is like uh, there was an opportunity last year to end natural gas flaring. And in, in pursuit of the perfect, we, we lost the good. And, uh, and we could have been, we could have stopped natural gas flaring in New Mexico, but we were looking for the perfect. And so, you know, I think we need to be a little bit more practical when it comes to some of, some of these things. Not everything's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's exactly what I was kind of saying is, is that they have a plan and they need a horizon that says, yes, and here's a plan that's better. And then here on the horizon is best. Yeah, I, I agree. I absolutely best. agree. Yeah, and we want to move to, to Sue online. Sue, oh, if you go ahead and unmute, please. Yeah, this was a great presentation. It got a little too technical for me. I just sat in on a clean energy conference yesterday. And one of the things that came up is how do you make green ammonia, um, usually, I, I understand it, it, it takes a lot of water to create, and we don't have that here in New Mexico. So what would be the answer? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, you know, there are very practical concerns. What may be good for the earth may not be an option uh, to produce in New Mexico, right? I mean, uh, there, there's a couple ways to look at this, right? Uh, right now, uh, it takes about, uh, uh, and uh, forgive me, right? If somebody wants to correct these figures for me, they can, but it's like seven gallons of water to produce one gallon of, uh, of harvested uh, petroleum. Um, uh, by, it, it, it takes mm -hmm. a lot of water yeah. in the oil patch to, to make oil. They use a lot of water, right? So uh, to a certain extent, you might be, we, we, we could make a certain <coughs> amount of hydrogen or even green ammonia uh, locally, um, without impacting uh, our water use dramatically compared to what is currently happening. Um, those are things to consider. 
Uh, but in terms of scale, you know, obviously I think uh, what's going to happen is that places that have low cost electricity uh, to make uh, green hydrogen and access to water, uh, you know, desalinization is energy intensive. All of these things are going to take energy. We, we just need to figure out who's got the better economics to do these things. And uh, it's a, it's a different, um, um, it's a different microeconomic conversation, mm -hmm. I think, to, to figure mm -hmm. out who will do these things most efficiently and where. Right. I don't know, does that answer your question? The, yes, it did. Uh, I had a second piece to that. So I was talking to a startup company the other day, and their research is around hydrogen created by an enzyme um, that is given off by a process of algae, the growth of the yeah. algae. And is that something that you'd like to meet or talk to? Oh, I, I love biofuel cells. I think there's some amazing opportunities. I mean, you know, hydrogen is such a fundamental building block. I'm just looking at Paul because uh, you know there, there are so many things you can't do without hydrogen, and it's most things. <laughs> uh, so I, I think any way that you can produce it and producing it from algae represents some really interesting opportunities. One of the aspects about hydrogen that I love the most, it's a very democratizing energy system. You know, little <laughs> Pacific islands can make their own energy. And those are the islands that are importing energy right now, right? So instead of like having to be reliant on importing and losing, exporting money and uh, trading it for hydrocarbons, they could actually be making their own energy. So there's a lot of opportunities in the space that I think, uh, and, and that's not something, you know, I don't have any technical competence or familiarity, well, in general, <laughs> I have no technical competence. Uh, that's a blanket statement. But uh, in, in general, I think, um, you know, uh, uh, biofuel cells represent a really interesting space for lots of other, lots of other development. All right. We've got uh, Sandra Thank with you. our last audience question. Hi, Sandra Hirschberg. I am a business development consultant for startups. I'm also in a company in a startup for two years now called Google Compensation. My question from one business person to another, what is your sales strategy? Oh, uh, well, uh, these are long sales cycles. Right, so this is very much professional sales. Uh, we, uh, we 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 take the sort of lean startup uh, education to heart, which is all about listening to the customer, um, and then and 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 prodding with questions. Right, so uh, it's it's all about trying to understand the problem they think they're solving, the problem that maybe they don't necessarily understand that they need to solve, uh, and learning a lot, awful lot about uh, what what they're trying to do before we propose solutions. Um, we have a specific solution set, so we, we don't necessarily uh, know primarily what we what we need to sell them going in, but we have a general finite limit of what we can do. On some specific customers, we're willing to tailor that to to, uh, to modify things and uh, adapt our own processes. Um, and, but we continue to learn, um, even in time even in specific instances, one that just surfaced recently that I can think of is that there are people who are interested in making um, lithium salts and they could maybe use our catalyst to do that. And so, you know, there's broad applications in, in some of these chemical processes. And a lot of times it just takes listening to really smart people to, for the light bulb to go on here. Thank you. Sure. So I'd like to take this opportunity to invite everyone to thank Webb for one of the most information dense questions. And it's my privilege to ask you the two questions we ask of every presenter, uh, green or blue? No, sorry, yeah. red or green? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Christmas it is. And uh, what can this community do for you? Uh, I, I adore this community so much. I mean, I, like I, we were just chatting about, like this is the re-entry point. It, We've been buried, and like one of the things that I want to do is I want to get re-engaged, and this is always, always, and forever has been for eight years now. <laughs> the re-entry point, the, the entry point, or re-entry point. If you get busy uh, and you want to get re-engaged with the entrepreneurial community in Albuquerque, this is what you do. You come to One Million Cups. So I mean, I think it's so essential. The the gift that you guys could give me right now is send me some, you know, director of R and D. Uh, Sales engineers, other folks like that. Uh, anybody who's you know even remotely interested in the space, I'm happy to have a conversation. It may be a very brief conversation these days, 
Um, but uh, but I'd like to have um, some folks looking for jobs come come by. Uh, and thanks again for our look at our future. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. It's good times. We, we don't have that. So, thanks so much. Yeah. Um, thanks. We don't have that much more time. We have. I. We have a couple of different. We've got any announcements besides your phone? All right. Oh, uh, I, I do think we're going to have an announcement. So I'm in Germany next week, and I think uh, International or uh, mm -hmm. International Hydrogen Day, 10.08 for the atomic weight of hydrogen. It, it doesn't quite work, but it, they get, you know, marketing people they get us there. Sure. Right. Yeah. So uh, um, we're going to try to announce something while we're we're not in Germany on October 8th, uh, but uh, we're going to try to announce something in anticipation. Um, so look for awesome, you know, cruise cruise LinkedIn and look for some uh, cool announcements and a free trip to Germany. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if maybe you get one of these high end roles, <laughs> you might go to Germany there you next go. year. That's right. So might sales and all. You're you're definitely taking the sales engineer person, she or he, to Tokyo. So oh, yeah. hey, Tokyo. Is Japan, Japan, Japan just announced their reopening. Uh, FC Expo, which is one of our largest shows that we attend um, in Tokyo. FC being fuel cell. Fuel cell? FC? Yeah, FC, uh, fuel cell. So, Fuel Cell Expo Tokyo is part of an enormous show at Tokyo Big Site on Tokyo Bay. Um, it's part of, it's one, one hall out of eight halls of sustainable energy. It's like Sustainable Energy Week in Tokyo. And it is at, I don't know, 180,000 people or something, mm -hmm. you know. and They'll, they, they'll have you know, uh, big wind nasals in, in the wind expo room and, and you know, and a room full of amazing stuff for all the different energy areas. So uh, that's a great awesome. show. Cool. Well, thanks again to Webb, uh, you know, one of the folks who's helped launch uh, our entrepreneurial startup tech community. We've got a couple of quick uh, announcements. I've got maybe an announcement and a couple of questions. So David, if you wouldn't mind coming up, Eric, and you as well. Uh, the question I've got before we, we welcome over here is the thing that we have to do is we have to ask, how many folks are here for maybe the first time? Do we have anybody who's first time-ish? First time-ish, great, that's fantastic. How many people in the audience here today would consider yourself entrepreneurs? All right, so that's uh, that's a good like 90%. That's a 92% exact. I want to say because I'm really good with numbers. Um, let me hand it off. There's a couple different events. I didn't. I was doing a little bit something over here, so I didn't come up with a list of different events. But there's lots of different events that are coming up, and I wanted to invite a couple of folks to speak about their event, just like a quick minute or so on each of those. Okay. Yeah, not my events, but exactly. an events that I will be at. The Angels. Yes, which you all can be at for free this Friday. All day, CNM Smith Brasher Hall Block Fiesta. So, if you're into blockchain anything, you probably are not going to hear a lot about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, but you will hear a lot about blockchain to work in the economies of healthcare, of energy, of all kinds of things that will be integrated onto blockchains. Uh, Tom Anderson with Devio is going to be one of the main speakers. Uh, he had a Technology called Novint, haptic technology, which he sold quite a few years ago, made a gazillion dollars. Now he's doing this venture with Debio. So, totally cool if you're into blockchain. Come to Block Fiesta this Friday, free, all day, Smith Brasher Hall at CNF. Awesome. Yeah, go to what I think it's blockfiesta.org. Block if you go there, uh, that'll, that'll send you in the right direction. And Debio is just really taking off. When we first launched Block Fiesta, you know, 17 years ago, just kidding. Uh, it, it seemed a little pre, you know, premature, not necessarily premature, but it was really early stage. So folks didn't necessarily know what was happening. Now, you know, Web3, NFTs, all that other kind of stuff, they're like where people are really aggressively out there and making money. So this is a great way, not only to learn a lot more about those kinds of things, but also to connect with people locally who are doing amazing things. Eric. And Erica is going to be a presenter we've got scheduled like in the next couple of weeks, but she's got an upcoming event. Hi, my name is Erica Burns. I'm actually the founder of Profit Pathways, which is a program that helps female entrepreneurs um, grow their business to six figures and beyond. And so um, we are actually hosting an event here in Albuquerque at the Clyde Hotel, November 11th and 12th. Um, it's for female entrepreneurs. So, so you guys, if you know any female entrepreneurs who would be interested in this, um, it's going to be an event for, where over the course of the two days, 
we are literally going to create a recession proof six figure blueprint. And it's going to be, there's going to, I mean, I'm going to be speaking obviously, but there's also going to be a ton of guest speakers, um, including, uh, I don't know if you guys know, Joni Griffith, uh, Katie Rice, a bunch of, you know, speakers about marketing, uh, PR, um, just a whole gamut of information to help these female entrepreneurs to grow and scale their business over the next um, year. So, That's great. yeah. And you'll be learning more about this probably about a week or so when, when Erica presents. Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, so where can we find more about this? Yeah, so um, you can go to the website. It's ericaferns.com forward slash profit dash summit. So it's called the Profit Summit. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, I'll go with it. Yes. All right. Well, in my event, so if anyone's ever thought of publishing a book, uh, my self-publishing course starts October 1st. And if you're at all interested, you can find out more at the women's thriller writers.com. Uh, that's it. Awesome. So let's see, it's 10, uh, we, we, can, we can kick you out of the building right now. I just wanna thank everybody for coming here today, but also um, I think, you know, web and what's happening with that and a few of the other things we've mentioned really do reflect, it's about community, right? So web was one of the folks who first helped start when there was that wave of different organizations that were helping start, uh, helping uh, promote startups and startup entrepreneurs and lean thinking and all those kinds of things. So it's really sort of in a way coming full circle, a huge exit or something might be that the completion of that, that, that circle maybe, and we're still hopeful for that. So I wanna thank you for that. One thing that has happened from time to time that I'll also mention is um, we may have something of a, a presence. It could be somewhat informal at uh, South by Southwest this year. One way to do that is to get in on presenting to their, uh, to the S, uh, SARP, South by Southwest startup pitch. Uh, there's more information about that that I'll share with the circles. But really, mostly, I just want to thank you for, for being here, part of the community today. I hope you'll let other people know what we're doing here every Wednesday from 9 a.m. And I hope to see you again soon. Thanks very much.